the early months of 2020, humanity became paralyzed by a natural phenomena. The COVID-19 coronavirus swept across the globe, hitting especially hard in the United States, where it would claim almost 400,000 lives by the end of what felt like the longest year in memory. Because the virus was spread through airborne transmission, COVID limited our ability to safely be with one another. We were unable to safely gather inside other homes, to share meals at a restaurant, to venture out to enjoy a stage production or a film, to attend concerts, to take vacations at popular destinations, or to do most of the kinds of things that enliven our free time and enrich our lives. COVID-19 made close friends feel like distant strangers, and it turned going out in public into a game of constant, total awareness. In watching the news, it became increasingly clear that poor leadership and a strained healthcare system had led to an untenable situation, one that would get much worse before it would get better. All of this was scary. It was depressing. There had to be a better way to endure a lengthy pandemic. For millions of Americans, the key to enduring the pandemic was to escape to the great outdoors, to embrace the wide open spaces where fresh air was plentiful and social distancing was the norm. So the response was an unprecedented number of visitors flocking to campgrounds, forests, parks, and hiking trails. This exodus to the outdoors was especially true in Pennsylvania, where I live, and this was the same impulse that I felt when I tried to approach the pandemic as an opportunity to reignite my love of the outdoors. I spent a lot of time in the woods playing and exploring as a child, but thus far I've spent comparatively precious little of my adulthood in those spaces. I'd always enjoyed the way that the forest lights up my senses. When I'm there, I can hear things better, or I notice smaller details in the landscape, or I enjoy the crunch of leaves under my feet, and I feel reconnected to something primal and pure. And so hiking seemed like the perfect antidote to the stillness and isolation that had been imposed by the pandemic. It could be a chance to unplug, a chance to escape. So with some new gear and a backpack full of high hopes, I set out to embark on new adventures in the wilderness, a place where I could shake off the dread of COVID. The clatter of the newsfeed and quarantine's heavy inertia. Out here, I could reconnect and relax. And it worked for a while. I found a measure of solace in nature, and I enjoyed a new sense of exploration and discovery as I hiked longer and longer trails, and I felt improvements in both my physical and mental health. But it was an uneasy escape. Turns out that one can't easily shut out a life-altering event like a global pandemic. And despite my best intentions, my mind increasingly turned to thoughts about the virus. And so my escape wasn't really an escape at all. Instead, Trips to the forest became a sort of strange lens through which I would come to think about the pandemic. A juxtaposition of nature's visible beauty against its invisible horrors. And the more I thought about these juxtapositions, the more I wanted to find ways to document them. And the more I thought about documenting them, the more creative inspiration the forest provided. So I set to work on this project. And much of the time, when I wasn't hiking, I was at home indulging some of my other interests. Uh, That includes writing, but also amateur photography and filmmaking. Playing analog synthesizers. Reading postmodern theory. And journaling. And so I used all of this to document what was going on in both my own life and the world during 2020, but to do so in a way that could more holistically capture my experiences than I could with just writing, film, or music alone. I decided to call it the Pandemic Nature Project. 
You're about to see 20 short vignettes that collectively capture much of how I experienced and thought about the year 2020. Together I feel like they create a kind of impressionistic story, a sort of visual autoethnography that highlights a year defined by stark contrasts. The beauty of the nature around me against the horrors being caused by the virus, the chosen isolation found in the woods against the forced isolation of quarantine, the physical improvement from hours of hiking against the mental decline from hours of doom scrolling. I hope that in these 20 juxtapositions, you can find a place to situate your own pandemic experience. We have been talking about the possibility of, of airborne transmission and aerosol transmission as one of the modes of, of transmission of uh, COVID-19. But we have uh, spoken about the, the importance of all of the different potential modes of transmission. Um, this is a respiratory pathogen, um, and so it is important that what we know fits into the guidance that we have. Those of, uh, of the virus that is needed in particular in this uh, route of transmission, uh, that is the aerosol or airborne transmission. Uh, so these are fields of research that are really growing and for which uh, there is some evidence emerging but is not de definitive. Um, and therefore, uh, the possibility of airborne transmission in, um, in public settings, uh, uh, especially in very specific conditions, uh, uh, crowded, closed, uh, poorly ventilated settings. Journal entry. The claims we make about the significance of a particular event, or of a particular time period in history, such as the year 2020, are at best contingent, grounded in what we know at the time, in what our present needs for those recollections are. Accordingly, our analysis comes after, from a removed perspective. Autoethnography is fascinating as a method in part because of its ability to try and do that kind of post-event analysis that most methods rely on, but in real time. This is why the visual and descriptive becomes so essential to good autoethnography. It must document why it made its claims. It's why I find especially creative or artistic autoethnography to be analytically provocative and critically productive. This also gives autoethnography practices a kind of impressionistic veneer, one that can be frustrating for a reader looking for the takeaway, but a nice place to stay and think for those who value a project that might create that space. And it is from this space that one might enter with empathy into the lives of others. It's worth noting there's two types of infectious disease impacted by deforestation. Vector-borne disease, and the other, which she'll get into in a bit, is zoonotic disease, which happens when a disease makes a jump between animals and humans, like Ebola, SARS, and COVID-19. How strong of a link did you find between deforestation and the rise in infectious disease in those areas? We saw it was very clear, um, and the forested areas that were pristine, we saw none of the vector, essentially. But when we took that same method to villages that were deforested, there we saw a many, many fold increase in the number of these mosquitoes breeding in the water and biting humans as well. Humans cut down forests for any number of reasons. Logging, mining, converting land to farms. When we settle on land that recently was a forest, 
or put our livestock there, it puts us and our food supply in closer and consistent contact with animals we wouldn't normally encounter. Journal Entry The scene was chaotic, lots of people stuffed into the grocery store, filling their carts full of staples, with long lines, stressed workers, and disheveled store shelves. It's what I've always assumed apocalypse shopping would look like. Subsequent trips have seen increasingly dystopian safety measures at the store. The regular appearance of empty shelves, signs about shortages, the introduction of plexiglass shields between the customers and cashiers. Tape on the floor and signs directing customers to stay at least six feet apart. Wait times for picking up an online order extended to several weeks. Enter only and exit only doors. Arrows indicating the direction that customers should travel as they circulate around the store. Blaring overhead announcements like, Please follow CDC guidelines. Stay six feet or more apart from all customers and employees. And consider wearing a mask. Please don't buy more than you absolutely need. Giant, Giant knows, knows that this is, is a tough, tough time for all of us right now, now and, and we're, we're doing, doing all we can. can. Police say a security guard was shot after getting into an argument with a customer. Four family members have been charged in connection with the crime. In Alabama, an off-duty officer was seen body slamming a woman at a Walmart when she allegedly refused to wear a mask. Police arrested a 25-year-old who they say pushed a Texas park ranger who was telling a group to stay six feet apart. And Oklahoma City police say a woman opened fire when told she couldn't eat inside this McDonald's, injuring at least two workers.
Journal Entry If America is a nation that can be defined as a whirl of things and events, then the American pandemic experience is the whirl par excellence. It is not, from this perspective, at all surprising that America is reckoning with some of its past sins, racial injustice and indifference, income inequality and poverty, at the same time that those sins are exacerbated by the pandemic. The American experience of the pandemic should not be understood as a singular aberration, but rather as yet another world grounded in the same primitive contradictions that formed prior moments of national crisis, many of which also seemed singular at the time. It's not a unique product of Facebook and Trumpism and anti-intellectualism, but rather the continuation of many past things and events. It was our unfortunate destiny. If history is at all a guide, this pandemic's particulars, its players, its lessons, its very reality, will be all but forgotten by the time we have our next episode. So Wade and Tom, please. Yeah, well, from our perspective, there's, we've had temperatures explode this summer. Uh, you may have learned that we broke a world record in the Death Valley, 130 degrees. But even in greater LA, 120 plus degrees. And we're seeing this warming trend make our summers warmer, but also our winters warmer as well. So I think one area of mutual agreement and priority is vegetation management. But I think we want to work with you to really recognize the changing climate and what it means to our forest and actually work together with that science. That science is going to be key because if we, if we ignore that science and sort of put our head in the sand and think it's all about vegetation management, we're not going to just succeed to get at protecting California. It'll start getting cooler. I you, wish, just, you just watch. I wish science agreed with you. <laughs> I don't think science knows, actually. <laughs> <laughs>A cellular tower set ablaze. In one week, police responded to seven similar fires, all targeting cell towers. 
They've since arrested a couple in their 20s and are investigating whether they might have been motivated by a conspiracy theory linking 5G technology to COVID-19. One of the first to suggest the link was this Belgian doctor back in January in an interview with a local newspaper. Within 24 hours, the paper removed the story. But the spark of the conspiracy had been lit. The weeks that followed saw the claim repeated over and over on social media. 5G weakens the immune system, allowing COVID-19 to attack. Others, like this American doctor, claimed there is no virus at all, but rather that 5G is poisoning people's cells. It doesn't make any sense. Well, there is a lot we still don't know about COVID-19. Microbiologists have put the virus under the microscope. Journal Entry During the pandemic, I've been using media to document my experiences. Some of this activity is probably subconsciously tied to the idea that whether I pass away during the pandemic or in some distant time, I will have left behind some kind of accessible media documentation for my family, friends, and any other interested publics about what it was like to be in this moment in time with them in these places. I do so because I hope that it might be useful for them at some future time in some future crisis. This creates a weird unease in the forest. When in nature, you're supposed to be experiencing a sort of real and direct connection to the world. But when you approach it from the perspective of, I want to film this, I want to document this, I want to show that I was there, I want to share this with them after, there's an immediate deferral to a future simulation. And as long as you have a recording device in your pocket, the nature that you encounter will always already be seen as fodder for sharing, is something that would be preserved in memory, that could be captured creatively. Nature walks, too, become hyper-real experiences. Good afternoon, Central Columbia parents and guardians. If your student is currently a CCSD remote learner, and you are currently using the CCSD T-Mobile hotspot, please remember that our technology department is here to help if you're having connection issues. Dot, 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 dot. You can reach the technology department by calling 570-784-2850, extension 4000. Furthermore, if you were a CCSD family that was issued a T-Mobile hotspot for the brief period we were fully remote learning, that device needs to be returned to the Central Columbia District Office as soon as possible. Again, come if you were a CCSD family that was issued a T-Mobile hotspot for the brief period we were fully remote learning, the device needs to be returned to the Central Columbia District Office as soon as possible. Thanks. Journal Entry 
Even when I'm out in the woods, I miss my family, and I'm always sending them selfies. At home, some of the more sentimental days are those where the family feels especially close. Usually this is due to spending more time doing things with one or both of the kids than we would otherwise, eating together more often at the table, sharing conversations that we wouldn't normally have when life is a little faster paced. I enjoy when we can watch a movie at night together, or go for a hike, or a drive, or have a nice conversation at dinner. There are some things that we're doing more right now that are really nice, even if a lot of the mood is more dour overall. Another thing I enjoy is watching my wife play Animal Crossing. There's this weird way that the game has become a defining part of our pandemic experience. She's created this lovely, pandemic-free world that I can't help but love, as it's become a beautiful expression of her own soul. And that's a weird thing to write about a game in which you regularly interact with a weightlifting pig and a zen-as-fuck yodeling wolf, but these are weird times. Pfizer has announced that the latest findings from its COVID-19 vaccine study showed the jab to be more than 90% effective in preventing the disease. Let's get more from Sky's Thomas Moore in Buckinghamshire. Um, this is obviously good news. Just, just how good news is it? Oh, it exceeds the expectations of, of many scientists, actually. So where does this leave us? There was a concept developed in the 20th century by Kenneth Burke known as perspective by incongruity, which is largely about the relevatory power of juxtaposition. He wrote that the notion of perspective by incongruity has obvious bearings upon the grotesques of our dreams. Dreams and dream art seek to connect events by a deeper scheme of logic than prevails in our everyday rationale of utility. The symbolism of both dreams and dream art 
make gargoyles of our waking experiences, merging things which common sense had divided, and dividing things which common sense had merged. For someone like me, it was difficult to come to terms with a global pandemic when approaching the problem head on. So a project planned to provide perspective by incongruity allowed me to engage the pandemic with a specific and peculiar detachment, a perspective that filtered every news headline through the lens of the natural world. This was especially useful on the darkest days in 2020. And it was also useful on the best days. Spending the year of the pandemic in the woods offered me a way to better understand my relationships, my politics, my profession, and myself. It allowed me to keep myself moving when everything around me seemed to stop. And it allowed me to keep making new discoveries when much of the world was closed. And it's my hope in closing that this project opens up some of that perspective for you. Because when perspective by incongruity works best, Burke tells us that our symbolic communication pushes us towards a brighter future. He writes that the machinery of language is so made that, either rightly or wrongly, either grandly or in fragments, we stretch forth our hands through love of the farther shore. <laughs>